Okay, hello. And uh, now we have Veli Pekka Kokkonen from Unity telling us about tips and tricks for the beginner and advanced user of Unity. So let's give him a big hand. Okay, uh, I have a huge amount of stuff I want to talk about. And so let's get started. And I will be going through uh, different areas of Unity. Uh, about uh, scripting, about user interface, uh, tips and tricks and hacks, something that we are not kind of really supporting, something we are supporting. And I'm going through these topics very quickly, and we'll see if we have in the end some time for questions. So the topic is that, no, okay, let's go forward. Okay, <laughs> tips and tricks for beginners, uh, more advanced users. One question for the start, how many of you have been using Unity for more than two years? Okay, more than one year. How many of you guys have heard about Unity? Okay, most of the guys at least, okay, cool. So, a little bit about myself. Uh, There's my name. People usually call me Veli, that's cool. And I'm one of the Unity developers, so the developer team in Unity isn't actually as big as people often expect it to be. And my, most of my work I do at the editor side. So I make uh, tweak uh, different workflows, make tools. Uh, I do some core, core features as well. So coding hacky hacky stuff, very close to the end user most of the time. So, a uh, uh, bit more about myself. I started programming about 20 years ago. Uh, I consider myself as a technical artist. I've done uh, all kind of programming, uh, modeling, texturing, animations, CGI, architectural visualizations, bunch of things. And yeah, so let's get started. We have three main topics here. One is the Unity editor, uh, second is the runtime scripting, and then comes the editor scripting. So let's get started with those. So Unity editor, we're going through a couple of things that people often miss or isn't really documented. First thing is the game object icon. So let's jump to the Unity. So uh, let's take empty scene. So, when you have an uh, empty game object that doesn't have any uh, physical representation, it's often very easy to miss uh, where it's located in the scene, or maybe you have a player that you're constantly modifying, adding more components, doing whatever. So, it's easy to find if it has some special icon for that. So, you can make a editor script, or you just, on the right side, at uh, icon on the inspector, you can press that and select the label. And then you see, always see that around the scene, wherever you go, and by clicking it, you can select that object. Or you can select other and select uh, you know, some texture to be used as an icon for that. So, you know, it's a uh, yeah, you know, kind of trick. Okay, next thing, uh, component copying. Uh, you, let's see, we have a rigid body here, and for example, we have your perfect values for everything there, and you're doing a refactoring of game objects, so you want to move stuff around, so you will actually want to like to copy this component and all the values to some other game object. So press the gear button, there's a copy component there. And then you go to some other game object. And again, from the gear, you can pass the component and make a copy of it. Yep. Easily, you know, I don't think it's, maybe there's some, some manual for that. Yes. Okay, inspector locking. So 
another, another little thing. Okay, uh, we have a little script here. Yes, why not? Whatever. Okay, you have a basic mono behavior script with an object array. So we can drop anything for that. And we have a game object that has the uh, mono behavior here. It has a one entry. And we can drop anything. For example, let's drag and drop this rigid body, game object to that. But sometimes you want to refer to a component straightly, but you don't want to use, you don't want to have an array of rigid bodies or something. You have to have just an object array. And you have no way of picking this component from here in the editor. So you can open a new inspector window by right clicking the tab, add tab, inspector, and drag it to the other side of the screen. So now you have two inspectors. And on the top side, there is a small lock icon. And pressing that, it will lock the view to that. So now you can select them something else. And you know, now you can just drag and drop it's the array. Simple stuff. OK, and remove array entries. OK, this is something. Uh, it's very common to use public arrays or lists and have some data in there. Let's see, we have three entries here. They have uh, that game object, that game object. There's some component in there. Um, in the end, we have like. 50 entries or something, and you notice, OK, middle of this array, there is some data that you don't want there to be anymore. So you want to delete something in the middle of it, or add in the middle of the array. So this is very uh, undocumented stuff. So you can actually do that. Uh, if you select the array element, it could be if you have a serialized class, this works there as well. With Control D, that's the normal duplicate, or Command D at OSX, you can duplicate that data inside of arrays. And if you want to delete in the middle of the array, you can use Shift Delete or Command Delete, I think, on the OSX as well. So the first will delete will empty the value, and the second one will destroy the entry. Uh, most of the time, I see people uh, doing their own inspectors for arrays and lists where you can add remove from a specific point. But you know, if you notice, you don't have to spend a couple of hours to do the tools for that. OK. I'll show hide hierarchy. Okay. Uh, it's very common that you have, for example, you have a very deep hierarchy. For example, uh, 3D game character with animations and stuff, and you select something on the scene, and then it pops out. And if you close it, it closes. But it, again, if you open it, it's like fully folded out. And that's, sometimes you don't want that to happen. So with Alt, press it down, and you click the arrow, it closes it. But next time you open it, it will just open the first entry there is. And same thing if I'm opening this with Alt, it will open the full hierarchy. That's very handy uh, when you're working on the project folders and you have everything folded out and you have a little bit of OCD going on. Uh, vertex snapping. Uh, again, this is in the manual, but most of people don't know that because it's kind of again hidden out. There isn't any menu stuff for that. So let's take another scene. Let's change the default. OK. So we have two cubes here. And we would like that to snap this cube and move it so this uh, bottom vertex is on this position. So we could try to move it around there or use grid movement or something. But if we have a arbitrary complex mesh and we want to snap something to somewhere else, gets really messy. So pressing V button. Oh, yeah, right. I'm not broadcasting anything there. So V as in V or Shift plus V. That toggles the mode. Can you see? Yeah. So if I press V, I can select vertex. 
and move it somewhere. Or if I press Shift V, it tackles the mode. So now it only selects everywhere these uh, vertices, and you can snap them everywhere. But here's catch. Uh, it doesn't walk uh, straight forward. It needs a collider. So if you want to snap, for example, you have a complex mesh, you want to snap something to those vertices, it has to have a mesh collider in it. OK. So that's about you know, little stuff. There is a bunch more, but we have uh, other things to talk about, about runtime scripting. This is uh, um, maybe a little bit for the advanced users as well. I have a couple of things that uh, very code-centric people often miss that you know, they want to do their own systems or whatever. So let's look at those. Let's start with animation curves. Uh, let's change the project to runtime. Okay, so about animation curves. We have, a, again, a mono behavior. It's on a cube, cube here, and there's an animation curve example script, and there's an animation curve. So first, let's check what it is. It's a curve, you know? You know? There is a nice looking green curve. You can add points there, move them around, make whatever you want to do there. So the idea is here that the horizontal line is the time. From here, we can see it starts from 0 to 1. We can zoom out and make 2 any time we want, just you know, tracking these along. And the vertical axis is the value. So in here, we start from 0, and we go to around 30. Yes, I think so. Yeah. And if we go through the time, so let's see, on the half second phase, we can see, OK, we have very low value, but after that, it gets very steeply over. And this is something you can sample from your scripts. It's just not just animating stuff out, but you know, it's sampling. And I will show you a simple presentation, uh, well, example, what you can use. So uh, in this, the mouse cursor, when it's on the left side of the screen, it's a time zero, and on the right side of the screen, it's a time one. And the value that we are taking, we are using for this cube's rotation. So when I move the mouse on this side, it doesn't actually rotate that much. But around here, the curve gets very steep, and it turns a bigger, bigger value. And if we watch the example code, uh, here. So we have the animation curve for the script. We are calculating the time from the mouse position. Then we take value from that animation curve using that you know, mouse position. And then we just rotate the object. And where do you actually use this? OK, I have one very nice example uh, here. Uh, at least most of the game programmers are very you know, uh, intrigued about this new Oculus. And when you're controlling game character through this Oculus Rift, uh, you will notice that okay, uh, turning the game character is pretty troublesome if you have to turn around 180 degrees or you have to use some thumb buttons or mouse or something. It's just just awkward. So what I've noticed works pretty well is that when you tilt your head and the Oculus, at, at the moment you, uh, you turn the game character by how much you tilt it, and then just you know, reset it afterwards. So that works pretty nicely. And for that, you need curves. So when you tilt just a little amount, you know, you don't probably doesn't don't, doesn't do any you know actual rotation. But when you tilt it more, then you actually start going. Uh, other things are for infinite runners type of games when you want your uh, game level constantly speeding up. You don't want it to constantly speeding up. You want to set it, OK, for first 100 meters, it's on this speed. Then it kind of uh, gets faster in a short pace of time, the kind of the next level. And it's in the next 100 meters is on with this, with this, uh, well, with this speed, and so forth and so forth, OK? Let's not spend more time on that. OK, invoke. 
OK, uh, all this scripting uh, stuff I'm talking about runtime is concerned about time, because that's mostly what games are, about time and animation. So we have our default start. We have, to, we have an invoke. And invoke is a method in MonoBehavior. And what it does is calls a method after some time. So in this case, we have a method called bar that's defined here. It has a, just a string for that. And after one and a half seconds, this will call it. And then we can set it to repeat. So first, one and a half second, let's call it first time. And after that, every 0.2 seconds, we continue calling it until we cancel the invoke, all the invokes, or a specific one. This could be something like, OK, play a character, it walks to a lava, and then it starts to take damage, for example, every half a second. And on this method, we call, like, add the damage, and maybe, you know, emit one particle to just showing up, OK, now it's taking damage, 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 until, you know, we cancel it. Maybe it's, you know, after it has been running for two seconds or whatever. Okay. Yielding. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what yielding is, a specific thing. It's a, yeah, you can Google that up. Uh, I'm going to show you how you use, use it, actually. And yielding is very powerful. So we have our common start here, but it's not void anymore. It's an enumerator. And it means that we can kind of this start method kind of gets called many times. It's just not, not once. But it's a bit different. So we have a yield return null. Okay, what this does is this actually waits for one frame. So when you start the game, you will go in this position. Then this will wait one frame. After that, runs this line of code. Then there's the next one, wait four seconds. In this case, it waits for 10 seconds, and after it goes to the you know, next line of code, whatever's happening. And this is waiting for the, the next fixed update. Maybe you're doing something on the update, or you get, uh, uh, for example, a trigger event, or collision event, whatever, and you want to wait for the next fixed update to add some you know, force or something for the physics. Uh, there is uh, lots of other things as well. And these are uh, pro license stuff. If you are doing async operations, you can get the async from there and just, just yield the returned value. And after it's done, you know, you can run again some line of code. Okay. And yeah. Here is uh, one example as well. On trigger enter, it also can be used as an enumerator. And in here, after something uh, collision event has been happening, you can, we can just wait for one second and do something. And you can check from the documentation of mono behavior. Uh, for every function, there is there is a on the bottom of the manual page, there is written if this can be enumerator or not. One common mistake is to use enumerable. So it's, I think it's like this. Yes, it's almost the same. It doesn't give any errors, but it just doesn't work. So don't do that. OK, this is very, very handy. OK, next one, code routines. And coroutines is, again, this yielding stuff. So let's start here. So we are running our start. And we want to start kind of coroutine. That's kind of the diff same thing that we have earlier. It's the start that we can wait on time and stuff like that. But we have to want to have them on our different methods. So in here, we start coroutine called bar. And we have it on bot bottom of that. So same thing again, enumerator. But then we have our infinite loop here, while true, and we are never exceeding. But in there we can, again, yield for some seconds, or just one frame, just one frame, and then, you know, do some stuff in there. And we can start this when 
whatever we want, then we can stop a single one or all of them at the same time from the game object. Or actually, I think it's form on a behavior, yes. Not game object, but the component itself. But there's a couple of tricky things. One is that if you want to call a method inside of the core routine, it doesn't do anything. It, it doesn't give any errors or anything. You can call that, but it just never actually gets called. You know, you can't do that. But you can do it in a very awkward way. So we have another core routine here. That's a foo. And you can call that by starting a new core routine. And after this has exited, it returns here and goes again. So the core routines are you know, pretty neat, but awkward at the same time. OK. That's about uh, runtime. Uh, let's move to editor scripting and start with editor window. I think there's uh, four main areas when you do, where you do uh, editor scripting. And uh, let's start with the most common one. Yeah. Okay. Editor. So, first of all, all editor scripts has to be on a editor folder. Can people see that? Probably not. Let's change this place. No, let's change this place. Come on. Something happened. Everything's okay. Well, you have to have it on the editor folder. Uh, the editor folder can be anywhere in the project. It has can, can have some different parent folder or whatever, but eventually there has to be editor. So I can run. Okay, simple editor window. So this time we don't uh, use mono behavior anymore. We use editor window and we use unity editor namespace as well. And we start by adding it to a to the main menu by using a menu item item. And you can put other stuff there too. You know, this is not just for editor windows. You can do other uh, static methods, you know, a small snippets, you know, everywhere using the menu item. So at start we initialize our window with this line that's very, you know, understandable what it does. And the main part is the on GUI. We can run it for it. So in this case, we have a GUI layout that does an automatic layouting for the, our GUI elements, so we don't have to put any rectangles on that. So there's just button, button to stuff. So let's look at this. Here we have a super framework. We have some window with a do stuff button. We can click and, I don't know, do stuff. Whatever we have ever wanted. OK. That's kind of the basic default thing people are doing. Uh, next thing is the custom inspector. So inspector view is this one in here. So when we select game object, yep, we can see all kind of stuff. And uh, we have a, our special script here, my script, and we have a swag meter there. So we got to go to from zero to maximum swag. Can we see it moving? Oh, yes, yes. Good contrast. Nice, nice. OK. So if you look at the script, it's only, there's nothing. It's just mono behavior with one float. And for growing that, we have to have a custom inspector. So we started by uh, defining an attribute, custom editor, and tell it that, okay, that's my script. So we have a, want to have a custom editor for my script. And this time we don't have an editor window, but an editor class that we are doing. Let's put fault this on so you don't get confused. Okay, so we have overridden inspector GUI. Uh, this means that we take the control for our normal rendering, how we render the fields, 
and instead we just you know do our own stuff. First thing is that we need the data, the value, and we can get it from the target. And the target is an object, so we have to first cast it to a MyScript, and then we can actually take the value, and then we have a slider. It's uh, we use the editor GUI layout slider. Uh, there's the value, and it goes from zero to one, so it gets clamped. Next, we ha we are uh, reserving some space uh, for Rect. There's a kind of four, two different things. There's a, uh, our immediate GUI functions, our immediate editor GUI functions, and also there's this GUI layout and editor GUI layout uh, functions as well. And we don't have everything in everywhere. So, for example, progress bar, we have it only on the editor GUI. There isn't editor GUI layout version out, out of it. So we have to specify the exact size. But here we do a kind of a tricky trick. So with get rect, GUI layout, utility, whatever, get rect, we kind of reserve some space from there. It's kind of, kind of automatic stuff. So we can actually get the rectangle and then render the progress bar back. Okay. Nice. Seeing GUI. Yeah, okay. Let's select our object from somewhere. Okay, we have a game object. It has the swag here. And also, if you go to the scene, on top of the scene view, we have a button again that we can press and stuff, stuff with it. So it's on the same custom editor class as well. And it's an on scene GUI. And you can't use straightforward the GUI functions in there. This is reserved for the handles functions. But we can use the GUI by starting and ending GUI through the handles. It's just, you know, hacky stuff. But after that, we don't, you could use GUI layouts as well, but you have to de define those areas you know, yourself. So in here, we are, instead of doing this tricky GUI layouts, initializing stuff, we just say, that, okay, on the left top of window, let's make a button, the rectangle button size of 60 pixels wide and 18 pixels high, and then just, you know, GUI button, button, and again, if you want to do stuff in there, you can do stuff. But there is a better stuff there uh, called the handles. And under the handles, there is uh, uh, lots of different gizmos, uh, moving gizmos, rotation gizmos. So if you want to do your own, I don't for example, uh, mesh editing tool, that when you select any mesh, uh, you will get uh, this special GUI. Uh, you can move all the vertices around, uh, move the data. So use the handles. There's a huge amount of everything there. Well, not huge, but you know, enough stuff. And you can also, you know, do your own custom things as well. Uh, there is so many specific hacks around the own scene GUI rendering and uh, making your own scene view tools that uh, I'm not going into there, you know. Use the Google, use the forums. There is a huge amount of info about those. Property drawers. OK, this is a new thing. Uh, came out um, Unity 4.1 or 4.0, I don't actually remember. That's easier way to do this slider. So you don't have to uh, make this whole custom editor stuff. Instead, you just specify an attribute. So this is a normal mono behavior. There is an integer value. And above that, there is an attribute range. And it, this will clamp the value between 0 and 100. And let's see in the editor. It's on the game object. Uh, is it here? So we have a you know, slider for that. Yeah, neat. You didn't have to do much of anything. And if you have, for example, an array of serialized classes and whatever objects, and you would like to have a, your neat custom uh, editor for that, you can do it by using, uh, by, by making your own 
property drawer attributes. Yikes. Um, it's a very large area, so I'm not going into there, but if you're interested, just Google it up. Uh, I will add some links for that as well later on, so you will, you will have some more and work with, you know, you can work with. But that's kind of handy. Okay, uh, on drop gizmos. So this is something uh, in the mono behavior. You can have a method called on drop gizmos. Uh, these are drawn only in the, on the editor. So let's look at here. On this game object, we don't have any mesh, no visual or simplification. Uh, there's only two loose scripts, and still we are uh, showing a ball here. So this is done. Uh, so many codes. Yeah. So. On the draw gizmos, we have the gizmos, and under that we can, you know, draw some basic primitives, uh, some rays and lines, cubes, spheres, stuff like that. Change the colors of them, and this will live with the uh, mono behavior component. And you can also, by clicking them, you can select the object as well. But what's a bit strange about this on Rocky Smos is that it, they kind of live with the runtime stuff, but they are editor stuff. So there's a Rocky Smos attribute for that. That's, this is, again, something uh, people usually don't know. And let's go check it out. It's on, on our custom inspector here. Yeah. OK. Instead of having that, that gizmo rendering on the money behavior, we can put it on the editor script for our custom editor stuff. Uh, there we use our draw gizmo attribute. And then we can give it a bit more specific. For example, on, show it only when it's that game ob object or component is selected or active or whatever. There's are different options. So then we will get the script on this. Well, in this case, it's my script. We just done with the value as well, and we get the small type as well. So we can draw stuff here and do other things as well. And then it's neatly packed on the same uh, editor script place, and it's not going with uh, runtime stuff. You know, it's kind of messy to get those on the same places. Okay. Uh, okay, we have some time still. Good. Oh. Scene view hack, yes. Okay, this is a hacky stuff, and we are not kind of, we are kind of, but not really supporting this. And you know, if you broke something, you can have the both pieces, so to say. Okay, I think we will change to. Uh, yes, let's change to. Oh wait. Hmm. Okay. Maybe I was a bit tired. OK, let's get a step back. Something I completely missed is uh, run in edit mode. So, OK. A mono behavior with, uh, you know, your common updates, nothing special here. Uh, we are calculating some transform and position stuff based on the object position, you know. But what's different here, it, it, the mono behavior has attribute execute in edit mode. And this means that uh, all the updates starts on enables, disables, are executed when you are in the editor and not actually playing. So let's go ahead and see. So we have a bunch of cubes here. Well, got planes. And if we select one of these, we can see, OK, there is a you know, transform, there is a your basic mesh and a script that edit mode execute. And if we, if we move this around, we are chasing the position and the rotation of the game object as well. So if you're doing some procedural stuff or custom level editing and you want to have, you know, something, you know, there on a fixed base, 
have a certain value based on whatever you're doing. So this is very handy in that way. So you don't have to do any uh, trick editor coding. You can just use your normal update. And we deal with that. And there was uh, another thing I kind of, kind of missed uh, in Unity, Unity 4. Yes, we finally support namespaces. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> finally. So if you're doing, uh, for example, asset store packages or something like that, you know, use namespaces. You don't get uh, nasty bugs or overrides with other people code. OK, let's go there. Good stuff. Okay, let's open the robot lab. Okay, scene view hack. Uh, okay, this is um, I will post all of these snippets afterwards. Uh, there's a lot of times when you want to get the scene view camera, and usually people say that okay, use the camera current, and you will get the uh, camera component that way that's used in scene view. But that doesn't actually always work. So there's a bit better one. They saw on the scene view. They saw on scene GUI delegate. And we can add a callback to that. In this case, uh, every time there is an on scene GUI event on the Unity, this method will be called. Uh, from the scene view, we can get a bunch of all kind of stuff. For example, the camera component. Uh, I don't know how well we are supporting this. This got hacky, hacky stuff, but uh, there's a lots of editor scripting uh, issues you can circumvent. Go over with this one, and if you see, this is one of behavior, but it's still it's only run uh, when we are on the editor. So kind of a runtime, but not really. OK. OK, let's go forward and look at the, uh, since we have a uh, little bit of time still, uh, let's look at uh, uh, one nice thing, animation window at Unity. People usually don't use that that much. And it's all, they, it has its own problems, but it's kind of nice. So let's start with are very easy to show feature. This is this is a way to add some product value very fast when you have a meeting coming up uh, in a couple of hours and you have to show all the cool stuff there is use the cool cam, so use the flybys. So okay, on the scene we have a camera. Let's go there. <sighs> camera game object. And let's open animation window for that. And let's make a flyby animation, just very fast. OK, so we have the animation window open. Let's play, press the record button. It asks you if you want to save animation. Let's save it. It's a flyby. And now the game object has an animation component with the flyby animation on it. And First, we have to select time. OK, let's go to zero time very fastly and move around on the scene that we want to, for example, start the flyby animation from this point. We select the game object. And from this menu, we can align it with the view. So it's moved here. We can see the frame. And let's go to three second point and move somewhere else and do the same thing again. But you know, there was a faster shortcut, so control alt F, no, shift control F, something control F. 
Yes. So this is the next point for that. And now we scrap the animation here. So you know, we have our nicely done flyby. We can play the animation. And it's just not animation window isn't just meant for animating position, rotation, scale. Uh, there is other stuff as well. We can animate shaders. For so we can animate actually anything that's exposed to the editor, uh, your own script values, for example, or anything. In here, we have a uh, we have a very common shader, just a, you know, bump specular, and we have an animation for that that we are animating offset values. We could just you know change this here while we had something have selected, so we can animate that. And in here, we have a curve for that that we just you know move the value from 0 to 1, so we can get this UV offset animating done. So you can animate anything. And one thing is also uh, animation events. When you have this camera animation going on here, we can add uh, a script for that, yeah, animation example here. And for, let's say, on this half second phase, let's press this Add Event button, and we get this small marker here. And if there is a, on the same game object, there is some methods on some scripts, we can select them from here. We have a play audio clip that gets, gets some data, and we can drag and drop audio clip in here. So when the animation is in this point, we will actually call this call this method, and we can check the code here. It's just, you know, play audio clip. It takes the audio clip as a parameter and plays it out. And so we can play the animation. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> so if you're doing animation where a play character is shooting a gun, so you want to have the audio clips played on a very specific point, so you can set them to there. Or run anything you want, any code, you would, you know, you would care. So uh, that pretty much concludes our session. And I will be post, post uh, all of these snippets, all the project files, everything, or the Unity Finland group page. Just go to Facebook, you know, join us and you will get all of these script snippets and stuff. And we have our boot uh, downstairs. So if you have any questions, anything at all, just you know, come to talk us. And we have a couple of Oculus Rifts as well. So you know, if you don't feel bad, so you will soon. I think it's time is up. Uh, one question. One question. Does anybody have anything? Who's the first one? Um, <clears throat> uh, well, I have a question regarding licensing mode. W what is the current licensing for the, uh, for example, not non-commercial purposes of usage of Unity? OK. So uh, you can use Unity, the free version. For, I think, pretty much for uh, any applications. There's a couple of restrictions for gambling, for example. For gambling applications, games, or whatever, you have to have the pro licenses and probably take, you know, have a call with our sales team as well. Uh, otherwise, you can do business with the free license until your revenue limit is up. And I think something like 100 thousand euros per year, I think, then you have to buy the pro license. The same thing is uh, with the new free uh, mobile licenses as well. But if you have very something very specific, you know, uh, I can link you up with our sales team. Mm -hmm. They know more about that. Okay. But uh, basically, it's just, you know, you can <coughs> go ahead and sell. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, in case of this uh, so-called free license, yep. w w what about the support? Do you have any support for the developers there? Uh, sorry? Sub support for the developers. I mean, do you have any support team, technical support team? Um, I think our all users are on the same level on the support. 
except some very big clients who have bought some premium support stuff. Otherwise, you know, there's the Unity answers where I give some out sometimes. I'm out there helping people out, the forums as well. And yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. So thank you everybody for joining us up. And Andy is next talking about Unity. Most of the Unity mobiles, I think. <laughs>